Hi, I'm Susie. I'm one of the librarians. Uh, welcome to a rather unusual lesson. Uh, I'm going to um, encourage everybody to have a piece of paper, the pen by their side, so that if you have any questions as I'm going through the lesson, that you can jot them down and email them to me. I want this to be interactive. I don't want you to be um, questioning anything and not have those answers. So today we're going to... First, we'll start off with a little virtual tour of the library website. Then we'll go through a very basic scholarly searching refresher. We'll talk about the Jet Find box, interlibrary loan, and then we'll look at subject specific databases. Specifically, we'll look at Comdis Dome and Gale Interactive Human Anatomy. We'll talk about some libguides and then we'll finish off with where you can go for extra help. So first, let's do a virtual tour of the library. And in order to get there, you start out by going to Malloy's homepage, malloy.edu, and then hover over academics. Don't actually click on the button, just hover over it, and you'll get this little pop-up. You could just click on library right here. As an alternate, you can also sign into Canvas and then just click on this little button right here. The advantage of doing that is that it will automatically authenticate, which means that the system will know that you're a Malloy student. If you don't do this step, then they're going to ask you for your login information so that they know you're a Malloy student and you have access to all kinds of articles that the general public doesn't have access to. So I'm at the library homepage. This is a jet find box. We're gonna talk about that more in a few minutes. Right over here is databases A to Z. If you know the name of the specific resource that you're looking for, you can come over here to look through it. Right here are databases by subject. If you wanna see what databases we have in a particular category, you can come over here to do that. Right here are our LibGuides. LibGuides are little mini websites that librarians create to help make your researching easier. I will talk about that more a little later on as well. Right here are journals. If your professor gives you the name of a specific journal that they want you to read through, you can come here to see which databases have that coverage. Here is our digital commons where you can see examples of work from um, other students and professors that is, um, open access. Right here is where you can book our study rooms and laptops. Now obviously that is not open right now, but during normal times you can um, book one of the study rooms on the second floor of the Info Commons in the public square, or if you want you can also borrow our laptops through here. Right here is our How Do I? It's like a little FAQ um, of all uh, some questions that are frequently asked. Right here is Ask a Librarian. That's also something that we'll discuss at the end. And finally, there is About Jet. So if you have any questions about the library, like you want to know hours or you want to know how many books you're allowed to take out, that sort of thing, you can click right there. Right here is Iliad Interlibrary Loan. Another thing we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Here's where you can see our library hours or where you can click on a chat box to ask us a question. Right here, sometimes people think that they can find library resources through this search box. This little search box is to search through the library's web pages, not through our resources. So what I mean by that is, let's say you wanted to find my phone number or something, you could click right there and search through the library's web pages, but you don't wanna look for articles there. I'm just scrolling down on the same page. Here's where you can see news and events, either look through all of our news and events or see or click on individual ones to see more info about those. Again, this isn't available now, but during the year, if you wanna see which computers are free or if there are computers free in a specific area of the college, you can come here and see at an individual terminal level what is available and what's not. Here's where you can get some info about our library services like interlibrary loan or reference and instruction. Here you can get information about our collections like our ebook collection or databases. And then finally, right here is where you can get information about our facilities like our Suffolk Center or the media viewing area. 
So if you have any questions, now is a good time to pause the video and quickly write them down before we get started on how to do some basic scholarly searching. And specifically what I'd like to talk about now is the difference between Google searching and library database searching. Because in Google, you could just ask it a question, right? You could just say, what is aphasia? And you'll get results. They might not be the greatest results, but in general, they're pretty decent. And the reason for that is because Google is asking you to talk to it like it's a person. Library databases, you always want to remember that you're talking to a computer. So what you're actually saying to the system is, I like the word aphasia. I want you to go through every single article that you have in your databases, and if it says the word aphasia, put it into a pile. Then go through that pile, and if it also said the word causes, give it to me. So you really don't want to put in a word like what or is into your search box because it's not specific to your individual topic. You're going to find the word what in all kinds of articles that are totally not related. So the words that are most specifically related are aphasia and causes. Those are the words that are going to get you the articles you're looking for. Another thing that I see students doing all the time, the professor says, oh, I want a scholarly article discussing phonological, phonological disorders, and that's what the student types in. But when you're actually writing a paper, you, ever, you never actually say, I shall now write my paper, right? So the same thing, people don't actually say, I shall write a scholarly article now. The words scholarly article rarely actually appear in scholarly articles. So those aren't words that you're looking to match. The words that are important that you do want to match, well, the word phonological disorders. In this case, I put them in quotes because I want those two words in that specific word order. Otherwise, I could have the word phonological in the top paragraph and disorders down at the bottom. This way, I'm only going to see it if the words phonological is directly followed by the word disorder. And then I've narrowed it down further. What about phonological disorders am I looking for? Well, maybe in this case, I might be interested in gender. So a couple of quick tips. Start out broad and add terms or limiters one at a time. You don't want to throw everything in at the same time because then you're not sure which is the term or limiter that might get you no results. So you throw in a, a term and you see what happens. Throw in another limiter and see what happens. Take something away and see how that reacts. Be flexible. It's not a science, it's more of an art. Make sure everything is spelled correctly. I'm a horrible speller. If it wasn't for spell check, I'd probably still be at English 110. Google's really great about this, right? They'll just say, oh, did you mean such and such? And by the way, we've already done the search for you. Library databases are going to assume however you spelled something, that's what you're looking for. So if you spell something incorrectly, you just get no results. Google is, <coughs> this is one of the, this is one of the instances where I would actually use Google. Just do a quick little spell check, make sure you know how it's spelled, and then you can throw it into the library database. Don't use punctuation. Again, remember we're talking to a computer. When a human sees a question mark at the end of a sentence, they say, oh, you're asking a question. A computer sees a question mark at the end of a sentence and says, oh, you're giving me a command. Very different. Don't use abbreviations either because they can mean different things in different disciplines and it's much better off if you just avoid them altogether so you don't get erroneous results. Okay, you've been listening to me talk for a long time, so let's take a look at a video from somebody else. How do you get from a research question to a pile of useful articles? Magic! Wait, no, what am I saying? It's keywords, or key phrases if you have more than one word. Keywords are index terms. The word index comes from Latin, meaning pointer finger. Index terms point the way for a computer to retrieve a particular document from a database. Two to four keywords or key phrases are usually sufficient for a search. This isn't a case of more is better. It's a case of the right amount is the right amount. Only use one keyword and you'll get way too many results. More than four keywords and you might not get any. Two to four keywords will hopefully yield a few dozen to a few hundred results. That's the sweet spot. The quality of your keywords makes a difference too. The more unique and specific, the better. Keywords come from research questions like this one. Are people who play video games at an increased risk of being violent? To get the answer, we need to squeeze our research question for some keywords that will lead us to relevant empirical research. 
First, we take a look at the question and cross out anything that doesn't contain specific meaning. Are people who at and risk of being. Play is just the word we use to describe what someone is doing with a game, and there really aren't any other options like working a game, so it's gone. Increased here is tougher. It's getting at the relationship between video games and violence, but I'm going to cross it out too because I don't want to exclude any research that suggests video games might decrease violent behavior. I'm not trying to find an excuse to demonize video games. I'm trying to answer a question. I don't want to blame something for the sake of blaming something. Okay, that leaves us with video games and violent. These are keepers because they refer to specific concepts and they won't bias my search results. Two good keywords can be enough, but it's good to be prepared just in case they're not. We've gotten all we can from the research questions, so that means we got to get creative. We take the keywords we already found and blow them up like this. Broader concepts go on top, narrower concepts go underneath. The original two keywords are probably still the best one. One thing I'd like you to add on the side right over here are synonyms, specifically synonyms that are used in your field. So if there is a um, specific term that scientists in the field tend to use as opposed to a general term, that's going to give you better results. I'll give you an example. I got my second master's in uh, criminal justice. And before I did, I used to call it the death penalty, like a lot of people do. But after getting my master's, I started to learn the language of criminal justice. And in those articles, they are much more likely to use the word capital punishment. So if I do a search for capital punishment as opposed to death penalty, I'm a lot more likely to get the results that I'm looking for. But these others could be helpful too. Thusly armed with keywords, you can choose a database and start searching. If you don't find anything right away, don't be discouraged. Our databases contain millions of articles, and we have dozens of databases. There are more articles in a single database than you could read if you lived five lifetimes. Provided you've chosen a real academic topic and not something bizarre like the relationship between Beowulf and Batman, there's going to be research out there. Oh wait, here's an article about that. Huh. If you aren't finding anything, it's because you're hunting for delicious penguins up at the North Pole. It's funny because they don't live there. Huh. Try a few different databases before you start to worry. Also, you only really need to locate one good article. Articles are written by, and I say this with love, hardcore professional nerds. They're gonna be thorough. Flip to the end of that article you found and check the references. It'll contain a comprehensive list of books and articles on your topic. You can then locate those articles in our databases or skim the text of the article for new keywords. Maybe you can find some terminology you haven't thought of yet. For example, a lot of the research about video games seems to use the word aggression. So remember, identify the key concepts in your research question in order to produce keywords, use two to four keywords at a time, try the same searches in more than one database, and if you find just one good article, treat it like a freshly slaughtered whale carcass and mine it for everything it's worth. Mmm, ambergris. Alright, so just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, to jot them down. Now let's talk about the JetFind box. This isn't the only place that I suggest that students go, but I do think that it's the best place to go for most projects to jump off from. So you find the JetFind box at the top of the library homepage. I pointed it out before. If I do a search over here for articles and ebooks, then I'm going to be looking through all the digital resources all at one time. All of the ebooks, all of the streaming movies, all of the articles, anything that lives in the cloud. If I look here in the books and videos, I'm looking through all of the physical items in the library the books, the DVDs, the educational manipulatives, anything tangible. And then the default is the combined results where I'm going to be looking at both tabs at the same time. In other words, I'm looking through all of the resources that Malloy has to offer all at once. So that's what I did. I just did a quick search for dysphagia or dysphagia. And here we go. They're starting to pop up. Now we have books and more over here. And then the articles and ebooks will pop up over here. Let's first take a look at books and more. So if I wanted to look at the physical items, I can start doing it from here, but I'm starting to get some reference books. Let's say that I'm looking for circulating books. I can come over here to more options. I don't know if you see that. It's right in the middle of the page, right here. And if I click right there, 
Now I have all these options. Now, reference means that I can't take the book out of the library. It has to stay in the library. If it's a book that I wanted to take out, the circulating book, just like books circulate, I'm sorry, just like blood circulates through your body, books will circulate through the system. They'll go out and they'll come back again. So here I did a search and now by limiting to circulating books, I found this book, which I can take out of the library. I can click on the title and that's going to bring me to the record page. And the record page is going to have a lot of information that I need to create my citations. So here is where the book was published and who published it and the year of publication and the author. I can come over here and I can look and see at the table of contents so I can get an idea about what's in this particular book. And if it looks like a book that I might be interested in, I can always come back to the holdings. Now, this has the, um, tells me where the book lives, but I can come over here to map it. It's a tiny little thing right over here. If I click on map it, I can see that now I need to go to the third floor of the library. And it shows me, here's the map. It shows me exactly where I need to walk into it and even what shelf it's going to be on in that room. I can also uh, text myself some of these call numbers, so if I needed to run in before class or something and pick them up, I can do that. So I found a physical book, but as, um, as you all know, the library is physically closed right now, so that's not going to help so much. Let's take a look at the digital resources. So I'm back to my original search, and again, I can do my search from here, but I have 97,000 resources. I don't know about you, but I'm not reading through 97,000 resources on any topic. So I'm going to come over here to more options. And again, I can narrow down that result. So Google makes it seem like 97,000 results is such a good thing, but nobody's actually reading through all of that. So I don't want this many. I need to narrow it down. The first thing I can do is I can click right here on this little box that says peer reviewed scholarly only. Just be careful. What I'm saying to the system is I only want an article if it was printed in a journal that contains peer-reviewed articles. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every article in this search is now going to be peer-reviewed. For example, you might find call, uh, conference proceedings, letters to the editor, book reviews, those kinds of things will pop up. They're not going to be as frequent, but it is something where you still need to double check that the article you are actually looking at specifically is peer reviewed. But that's only got us down to 72,000 results. That's still too high. So the next thing I can do is I can come over here to the year of publication. See something from from uh, that's 10 years old is might be too old. So what I'm going to say is no, I only want things that were written from 2015 to 2020. And I'll click set and I'll get rid of some of those older articles. Now I'm down to 26,000. Another thing that I can do is I can come over here to subject area. I'm just going to click on this little down arrow. And now you can see the different perspectives. I'll click more just so I can see all of them. I can see all of the different perspectives that this topic is going to be attacked from. So let's say that I'm really looking at the anatomy and physiology perspective. I can click there and I'll get rid of some of those other perspectives that aren't particularly helpful to me. Now another thing I do, I'm just going to click right here on this more, it's right here in the middle. What I did is I said to the system, I like the word dysphagia, go through every single article, and if it mentions that word, give it to me. But it could be about, let's say it's about a patient who happens to have a comorbidity that with dysphagia, but that's not really the focus of the article. It's not really an article that I want. But if I click right here on this word dysphagia, these articles were not just mentioned as having dysphagia in them, these were actually tagged as being specifically about dysphagia. So it's going to be a much more targeted search. And you see now I'm down to 288. I can always pick more if I want. Let's say um, I'm only interested in males. Now I'm down to 116 articles, but I know that they're going to be tagged as being about dysphagia and um, males that they're going to be written within the past five years and they're within the anatomy and physiology subject area and they are all peer reviewed. 
So now I can go through and I can look and see, all right, this looks like it might be useful. I'll click on the title and it's going to bring me to the record page. This has, again, a lot of the information that I need to make my citations. Here's um, where the, uh, excuse me, the journal title and the volume number, issue number, page number. Here are all the authors. If I scroll all the way down to the very bottom, here is the DOI. Here is a little summary about the article. Now let's say I found this article, but I'm having trouble finding other articles on the same topic. I can look at the subjects right here and use them almost as suggestions for other search terms that I might want to try next. If I looked at all this, I say, yes, this looks like a good article. I'll click right here to link to online access. Now, again, I look through every database that we have. I don't know which database we're going to right now, but I don't know if it matters so much. So in this case, it brought us to an EBSCO database, which means that the PDF is going to be over here. If I had um, been in a different kind of database, like a ProQuest database, it might be up here or over here. Don't let the fact that they look different throw you too much. They're going to tend to have the same kind of information in them. So I can just click right here and I'll get to the record and I can click on the PDF and I'll get to the full text of the article. Okay, let's go back a little bit. So I'm back at my, the search that I built. I don't have to change everything. You see that it has kept my filters. So let's say I have all of these, but I say, no, you know, I really don't want the anatomy and physiology um, subject area. I can click on the little X here and get rid of that without having to rebuild the rest of my search. So now it's expanded it a little bit, but you can see I still have all of these other filters and, and things on there. When I make choices, other choices go away. Because I picked peer review, I eliminated ebooks because in general ebooks aren't peer reviewed. So if I get rid of peer review, now um, let's get rid of something else too. A lot of times, if you have too many subject areas on for uh, line, looking for ebooks, you're not going to find what you need. So let's get rid of mail. Let's see if I just can find anything of a book that was written in the past five years. I can come down here to more and you see if I click right here on book ebook now I have three books on this specific topic and if this looks like it might be a useful one again I can click on the title bring me to the record page and now I can link to online access and I'm going to get to the full text of the book so here is the book I can read online and I'll see the full text of the book. Now I can just read through this whole book like I want um, if I want to like a regular old book or I can skip around over here. So I can even pick in a um, and do a keyword search which is one of my favorite things to do when I'm doing ebook searching. So if I say I want dysphagia, let's see if I remember how to spell it. All right, so now that I know how to spell it correctly, let's try that again. Ah, see, now we have 98 sections, 98 instances. And you see, if you look at these little bars here, it doesn't actually mention it in the title page or the copyright. You can see it mentions it a little bit in certain places, and then all of a sudden over here in disorders of swallowing and voice, you see it's mentioned a lot. I can click on this little arrow, and I can see in context the word. Just click around here and you'll see that it'll highlight it for me. So I can select some text to highlight it or I can select some text to create a note and save it. And those automatically go into my bookshelf up here. I click on my bookshelf. You can see all of the, you'll be able to see all of the different times that I've annotated you can see my little annotations here and I can easily jump back to them
makes things really easy when you're doing research. And the nice thing about it is that these uh, highlights and notes are going to stay there as long as you need them. So if you start doing some work in the beginning of the program and you remember that you saw something somewhere at the end of the program, it wouldn't be too difficult to go back into your bookshelf to find whatever you're looking for. Okay, uh, so once again, I'm going to ask that if anybody does have any questions that they please write them down now. So we found some books, we found some articles, now we're going to take a look at Iliad, also known as Interlibrary Loan. So I'm doing research here, and I say, oh, I really like this article. So I click to get online access, and I get to this page sometimes. Sometimes you won't get this page, but if you do, you can look and you say, oh, I, all right, let me see if I can look up the full text here. And I get this runaround where it eventually tells me, no, you might not have access to this content. If they ever ask you to pay for articles, you should never, ever, ever pay for articles, okay? What you do instead, I'll go back to get access. Sometimes you'll just directly see this page or you'll see those stop get pages. Either way, sometimes you'll find an open access version. If you don't, then you click right here to request via interlibrary loan. It's a free service that we offer where we borrow books and articles for you from other libraries. Uh, we'll deliver them digitally to you. Obviously, if it's a physical book, you would have to have it um, during regular semester. You you come into the library to pick it up. During this time period, we're only do, going to be doing digital interlibrary loan. So I'll click right here. And you'll have to create an account. So the first time users, you click right over here. But since I already have an account, I just log in. And you see it's already actually filled out this form for me. So all I have to do is scroll down to the bottom and submit. I'll get an email when the article comes in. I just sign back into the system and click on electronically received articles to get it. It only stays in the system for a month. So my suggestion is, is as soon as you get that email, sign in, download, save it to your computer, and then you can have it for the rest of your life. All right, once again, if you have any questions, please write them down. Before we start, now we're going to switch to subject-specific databases. And the first one that we're going to look at is called Comdis Dome. So I just told you that when we look at the JetFind box up here, that we're looking at every single resource that the library has all at one time. So why would you want to use a specific database just for, com um, for communication disorders? Well, it's specifically designed for it, and because of that, it's going to have a lot of resources that a more general database isn't going to have. So I'll show you what I mean. I'm at the library homepage, and now we're going to go to databases by subject, and then communication, science, and disorders. And you see there's a whole bunch of them listed here. The first one we're going to look at today is this one right here, Communication Sciences and Disorders, Comdis Dome from ProQuest. So this is what it looks like when we first get in. And I'm just going to do a pretty simple search for aphasia. And I, I clicked on peer review already. So I did my search. And here are my results. Now again, I can click on the subject term aphasia, just like I did last time in JetFind to further narrow down what I'm looking for. I can pick a specific date, just the same way as I did last time to narrow that down. So in this case, I've done my search and let's just take a look at a record. So here's my record. Now, this right here is one of the reasons why you might want to go to a subject-specific database as well. It shows you the articles that cited this particular article. And this is a really great way to find other articles, to find them quickly. You don't have to find all of your articles from the initial search. You find one or two articles, and then you can look in their um, work cited for other articles. And you can also see who cited somebody and use articles that way. So in this case, this particular article was cited by tw 12 other articles and I can see who they've cited and follow down these kind of bread trails. 
I'm never going to click on the citation managers within the databases because they're often wrong. I have no problem with citation managers when they work, it's just that these don't tend to work. So at the end, I'll show you where you can go for reliable citation information. All right, now I'm gonna click right here, access to full text. Now what actually happened here, if you notice, I'm in a ProQuest database, but it has a system that will do a search through all of our databases. So this actually found it in a different database, which is why it looks different. But to me, this is a good thing. Now I found some other recommended articles and citing articles that I can continue to find, and they found more than the other one. So now I have a whole bunch more articles that, are, that I can find. Again, I'll click right here to download the full text in PDF, and I have my article. Sometimes you might see this window. If you see that, you just have to click right here, and it's just telling you that it's found it in a different database. All right, a uh, reminder to write down any questions that you have. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at a really fun database called GAM Interactive Human Anatomy. People really love this system, so I'll show it to you. It's fun to play around with. So um, again, I'm at the library homepage, and I'm going to go to databases by subject, communication sciences and disorders, and again, this time I'm, I'm just going to click on Gale Interactive Human Anatomy. And there's a couple of things that this system does. First, I can choose to look at something based on a particular system. So if I'm interested in the circulatory system or the digestive system, I could choose a specific region, like if I'm interested in the inner ear, whatever. Or um, if the library, um, if the campus was open, I can even pick 3D printable, printable models that I can use for the 3D printer that is in the public square. In this case, I did a search because I, I know the name of a specific system that I wanted to look at. So I just searched for cranial nerve nine. All right. And so now here we are looking at cranial nerve nine. And you'll see it's building up the brain of somebody right now. Now, if I want to, I can pull this apart and see all of the different pieces and how they all fit together. And I'm just doing this by holding the left mouse. If I click on the right mouse button, then I can click and change the position of the body. And it makes things really easy so I can see all of the different pieces and how they affect each other, how things are put together. And then there are little lessons that this is actually going through where it's going to explain different pieces to me and show me things. So it makes things really easier, easy if I want to learn about different aspects of a particular body. If I want to learn about different aspects of the system and you see, I can just zoom in and zoom out, move things around, pull things out. It's a lot of fun to play with. People really tend to really like these. I can also pull out individual slides if I want to, right? So I always suggest that people want to play with these. It's a lot of fun. And it's also really helpful for learning how all of the different aspects of the body connect with each other. All right, so now we're going to take a look at two LibGuides. Like I mentioned earlier, LibGuides are mini websites that librarians create to help make their research and to help make students researching easier. So the first one that we're going to take a look at is the communication science disorders one. So I'll come right here to LibGuides off of the library homepage. Now you can see I just clicked on communication sciences and disorders. I'll just click on the title one right here. Just like people have different writing styles, librarians have different libguide styles. So they don't always look the same. In this case, the librarian has broke it down into books, databases, journals, websites. This is always a really good place to go, especially for things like websites. It's really difficult to find good quality information online. So having somebody who's already vetted the resource for you and you know it's trustworthy makes things a lot easier. So if I click, for example, on websites, it shows me a whole bunch of different organizations that might be useful. And it'll show me some books that I can use. These are all really great different resources. So it's definitely something that I would suggest that you check out. And then the other LibGuide that I wanted to show you, I'm just gonna go back to LibGuides. <coughs> 
And this is by far our most popular loop guide, and that's this one right here, the writing and citing loop guide. As I had mentioned, we don't suggest using the citation managers that are embedded into the databases, but I promised I would show you a better place to go, and you can go right here. You see that we have a tab for citation managers. There's a whole bunch of them here. Academic Writer is a really great one for writing your papers in. It will keep track of your citations as you build them and automatically keep track of any in-text citations you make to um, build a works cited page at the end for you. Zotero is another really useful one. It's a very robust product, so I don't have time to teach it to you now, but it is something where if you wanted to learn it, you could always schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment. This way it allows you to save articles the full text of articles, uh, organize your citations into different folders and files. Um, it's a very robust product, especially as you're working towards your thesis. It could be very useful. Uh, and you see there's also other information here, like we have information on how to cite. Um, there are different manuals here. Here is the writing center's guide, different websites that can be helpful. So there's lots and lots of info here on writing and citing. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about today is where you can go for help. Being a librarian, just like uh, being a speech language pathologist, is a helping profession. I like it when people ask me questions. So I'm going to show you all of the places to go. Unfortunately, some of these are not available right now, but they sh I want to explain them to you anyway because they will be available as soon as the campus is open again. So from the library homepage, if I just click right here on Ask a Librarian, now I can see all of the different ways that you can get help. So anytime you see a little chat box like this, you know, this little icon, you can click it and a little chat box pops up and you can ask a librarian a question. Um, this is available anytime the library is open and this service is still going on while the physical campus is closed. You ask a question, you'll be asking one directly to one of the Malloy librarians. We don't farm the service out. Here's where you can see our normal hours when we're open. You could also text us from your phone. I don't actually know if you're using the chat box or if you're using the text box. It doesn't really matter to me. I just scroll down on the same page. You could also email us. And here you can see where our email is. Or you can call us up. Or you could schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment. This is also still going on during the, the closeout. So you could sit down with the librarian for a half hour to an hour. We could help you find any sort of research you need. Or if you wanted to learn how to use one of the systems, like I had mentioned before about Zotero. And you could do this virtually with a one-on-one -on -one librarian through a Zoom appointment. So I hope that you all had a, um, that this was helpful to you. If you could please go to this website and fill out this little survey for me, I would really appreciate um, any feedback that you have, especially since this is a fairly unusual lesson. Thank you so much. Have a good day.